doing that statement. Now, here's a phone number. You can call in and give us your opinion. Press one for yes or two for no, whatever it was. Okay? Right. Of course, I called in. A lot of my friends called in. A lot of people called in. Well, overwhelmingly, he found out that people did not like that he was trying to pass a universal background check system here in Nevada because it doesn't work. All it does is it makes it harder for law-abiding citizens to buy a gun. And it, it really just shows the kind of person you're dealing with. And then the same thing happens with him and Galipsy. Both of them say that they do not have the authority to, uh, to do anything in this situation. And if you, I, I remember you and I both talked about a statement that Governor Sandoval had released very disturbing because he said that I've warned BLM that they uh, that they need to be careful, basically. Right. And I I just that doesn't do it for me. You know, you're either for us or you're not. There's no in between. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you, Lori, the, the candidate for for sheriff. That's correct. He's running for for sheriff there in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clark County. Uh, yeah, that's Clark, Clark County. County. Well, you know, I would tell you that I have to agree with you. Um, Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon is a very serious crime. Uh, in, in the state of Nevada and in the state of New Mexico, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon consists of, um, you know, utilizing weapons such as an AR-15, for example, and knowingly, willingly, intentionally pointing that weapon at someone without just cause. You know, when I was police chief, if one of my officers had pointed an assault rifle at you know, a group of children, protesters, ladies, men, whatever the case may be, um, and I, I, a complaint was filed, I would have launched an investigation, and my officers would absolutely have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they were justified in their actions. Mm-hmm. If they could not do so, then they would be terminated and prosecuted <coughs> for criminal action. Right. None of that took place with the BLM, but rather um, Sheriff Gillespie, takes a stance, well, you know, I can't do anything about this. This is outside my privy. It's outside my scope of responsibility, which is total and utter nonsense. He violated his oath. He violated the trust of the people. When he arrives at the uh, at the speaking engagement uh, at approximately 9 o'clock in the morning, the day of the 12th, uh, he led the people to believe that he had put forth um, an edict, if you would, to the BLM, to cease and desist. That's what he led the protesters to believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found out that, in, in fact, that was not the case. Um, it was it was just basically a ploy. And, and really, his actions could have led to bloodshed because he he gave the people a false sense of security right. that they were they were going to be allowed to go pick up these towels and, and protest peacefully. And when they get down in the gully. Uh, the dry riverbed instead they're met with assault rifles right and and you know um i would really love to go into that a little bit further if y'all could give me just one moment certainly all right and then at a last minute note i'm glad to be able to introduce to everybody the 2014 sheriff candidate for Clark County, Nevada, Gordon Martinez. Welcome, Gordon, to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me on your show. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm I'm glad to be able to speak to individuals who are true believers in liberty and freedom. Um, well, you got that right. <laughs> I know that you kind of floored a lot of people when when you've been standing up for the Constitution and those. Uh, Candidates that are going against you don't quite know what to say about that, do they? No, they don't. Well, they're going to be a little bit red-faced because maybe some murder indictments might be coming down against some of them. I did hear that. Is it true that every one of the candidates that are running for sheriff, with the exception of you, are under investigation for being either involved with or complicit with the murder of a fellow police officer. Is that correct? No, not all of them. Just three of them. That'll be Joe Lombardo, Larry Burns, and Ted Moody. They were all there in the police administration when Officer Kevin Daly went missing. Okay. So that would be back in 2007. That is correct. Okay. And those uh, and the FBI uh, who contacted me after legal depositions that were taken in 2013, in June of 2013, the FBI contacted me and wanted my depositions. So they opened up an investigation, but you know they're.
started swollen with molasses anyway. Right. But it's, it's coming. Well, now, isn't Sheriff Gillespie also involved with that? Well, you bet you he was. That would have been his, uh, his uh, first term, I believe, yes. It would have been his first term, uh, 2006. Wow. So the 2007 is when Officer Kevin Daly went missing, and they found his severed head uh, rotting out there in the desert by Lake Mead. Wow. It's no wonder the and, poor Bundys are having such a problem right now, is it? Oh, and, you know, this is just part of the course out here. I, I, I'm i not kidding you. I think Nevada sets the standard for corruption. That wow. everybody else in the nation can uh, go ahead and follow. Right. Absolutely. I believe wow. that. Um, Dave, uh, didn't you have a question that you wanted to ask Shane? Yeah, Shane, I uh, I had a question for you. I heard that it was uh, it was pretty tense down there at Grand Victoria, uh, down with the BLM down there at the Bundy Ranch. Can you kind of go into it a little bit more for us? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, it was definitely a, a tense moment, to say the least. That that will be a, a, a drastic understatement. You know, I was asked to, to go down there on behalf and talk to some sheriffs of Peace Officers Association. I signed up with the TSPOA as chief of police uh, here in New Mexico, small town that I was working. Uh, I, I went to the TSPOA, I signed up, and uh, I haven't given up the fight ever since. So Sheriff Mack called me up, told me what was going on down there at the Bundy Ranch, and asked me to go there in his stead until he could arrive on scene because he was coming from a, a location that was going to take him a while to get there. I, uh, I drove nine hours straight through. I got there, and... Um, when, it, when Sheriff Gillespie came out and made his announcement, uh, he, he made his announcement in such a way uh, that it was blatantly obvious he wanted everyone there to believe he had um, defused the situation and ordered BLM to stand down. That, that's the way he represented things, uh, whether it was directly or vicariously. So ultimately, all the protesters, peaceful protesters, went down to an area where we were not restricted from being. There was no sign saying you're not allowed here. There was, there was no one telling us we were not allowed there. Uh, in fact, uh, the Nevada Highway Patrol blocked the interstate and allowed protesters to assemble in that area. And so a, a lone journalist went down into a dry riverbed uh, and was suddenly assaulted by a Bureau of Land Management, literally assaulted. They're pointing AR-15s at him, telling him they're going to kill him, and they're going to kill protesters. He's got it on video. There's no refuting what happened. So at that point, uh, word got out what was taking place in that riverbed, and approximately um, 600 protesters uh, converged on that location, waving American flags, don't tread on these flags, the state of Nevada flag, signs that say no BLM, uh, just people wearing t-shirts that were showing a solidarity for the uh, Bundy family. And at that moment, um, when, when I crossed through the, uh, the majority of the protesters were there and ended up on, you know, inadvertently on the front line, literally, of what was, was transpiring, I'm staring down the barrel of a gun. Here are armed federal agents, uh, bureaucrats, Telling me over a loudspeaker, they're going to shoot and kill me. Now I'm unarmed. I'm wearing a cowboy hat, you know, jeans and boots in broad daylight. This ain't Harlem. This is not the riots in, you know, in Las Vegas, in, in, uh, in California. You know, this is a bunch of ranchers, people on horseback, holding video cameras and signs. My, my hands were in the air showing that I had no weapon, and they're still pointing guns at me. They didn't lower their guns. So to say it was a tense moment, yeah, it, it was very tense. Uh, oh, I'll say, what? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was extremely tense. I ended up calling Sheriff back, and I told him that, you know, I was not sure whether or not I was going to make it out of this, and that if I did not make it out of this, I wanted him to be sure to know that uh, I was unarmed, I was, I was not breaking any law, and that I was standing for liberty to be sure to tell my wife and, and child that I loved them. So, yes, it was a very tense moment. Wow. And oh, my God. Seems like the, the First Amendment just got trampled on, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you know, these bureaucrats set up these little pig pens uh, and, and, and 
had stuck signs on them and called them First Amendment zones. So the protesters, and we, we, we tore them down and we put up a sign and it said, it said the First Amendment is not a zone. Right. Oh, that, that's beautiful. Absolutely. Have you ever heard of anybody uh, putting up a, a sign about a First Amendment zone? Have, have, have you know, any other any other incident uh, that uh, they put up a First Amendment zone? Is that something new? Well, no, it's uh, not. Um, I, I've heard of it even on college campuses, and they've been fighting back and um, getting in trouble for it because people have been suing about it. But uh, it's not the first time they've tried it. Um, now, as far as BLM, maybe. Uh, but as far as across the United States, they've they've tried it in different areas and and have gotten by with it. And they don't call it a First Amendment zone, though they call it a free speech zone. Um, you know, and then on the campuses, they will say something to the effect of, "You have to go into the office, and you have to file for this, and you have to get permission for this day, and between these certain hours." And so the college students are even fighting back with lawsuits against that. So. You know, it's it's a scary time we're living in, and and since I have you all on the line, I I need you to reiterate to the American people, the ones who are not awake, let them somehow, uh, or or can you possibly explain to them somehow in in your version as law enforcement for as long as you've been, just how dangerous of a situation this is if we don't stand up to this tyranny now, what what we're facing. Well, you hit the nail right on the head, Laurie. Uh, the, uh, the importance of everyone to become aware, to wake up and see uh, that our Constitution and our amendments are getting trampled on. And the only way for it to finally, uh, I guess, come to fruition is for somebody to stand up and say, no, uh, you can't do this. This is against the supreme law of the land, and that the federal government is overreaching again to try to intimidate everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I'm listening to Shane there say that he was his life was threatened. He had guns pointed at him. He's unarmed, and he is exercising his First Amendment right to 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 protest peacefully. And he's being, and his life is being threatened. That sounds like a third world country, not not America. That is the America that I know, and I've only been in law enforcement for forty years. Right, I and have you never. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, I, I would like to comment on what you just said, if I may. This is Shane. Go ahead. Um, yeah, as I as, as I recall uh, history, and in, in, in the history books, as as I've read them. There was a, a young lady by the name of Rosa Parks. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Yes. But uh, you know, she she chose to sit at the front of a of a bus. Well, oh, yeah. the law said oh, yeah. it was against the law to sit on the front of the bus because she was an African American, because oh. she was not the the desired color, uh, ethnicity, uh, gender, what have you. It was against the law. For her to sit on the front of the bus, she made um, a resolution, a decision, a determination, if you would, that she was going to sit on the front of the bus anyway because she was a human being. Right. And although there was what was a law dictating her actions, she knew that it was not a just law. Right. She knew within herself that it was wrong. And just because the government, the federal government or state government, declared her to be an illegal person or less than a human and not allowed to sit on the front of the bus, she knew within herself that that was not a just law, therefore she stood against it. I, mean, I would submit to you that what happened on the Bundy Ranch was no different. Right. The people there, 